Hey, everybody, it's Pastor Brian Ross from Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We want to welcome you once again to this midweek video. We appreciate you tuning in as always. If you haven't already done so, if you consider subscribing and ringing the alarm bell here on YouTube as a way of staying current with the ministry when we go live from the assembly building on Sunday morning, as well as when we create content for you here midweek, <clears throat> we would certainly appreciate that. Also want to remind you about our Rumble channel here, Grace Life Bible Church on Rumble. We established this as an all-tech site. Should something happen to our YouTube ministry, so if you're into all tech sites or would just like an alternative to YouTube, please consider checking us out here on Rumble as well. My featured books this week, or the, in this video, excuse me, are once again my co-authored book with my former professor, Dr. Dale DeWitt, J.C. O'Hare and the Origins of the American Grace Movement, 1899 through 1958. This is a full-length featured church history book covering the life and ministry and theological development in the ministry of J.C. O'Hare, a very important figure in uh, American fundamentalism and dispensationalism in the first half of the 20th century, also arguably the fountainhead of the American Grace Movement. So it's an important book uh, if you're into the history of dispensationalism, as well as a shorter book, a sketch of the life and ministry of Bullinger, E.W. Bollinger, Assessing His Life, Ministry, and Impact. This book uh, covers issues related to, the main focus of the book is on um, ascertaining theological development in the life and writings of Bollinger and tracing down how he, in the late, uh, in the 1890s, he was arguably a mid-axe dispensationalist, and then in the next decade and a half, um, switched and began to enunciate and articulate what became known as Acts 28 dispensationalism. So both of these books are important as far as the history and theological development of dispensational truth. You're definitely going to check those out if you're interested. Again, the reason I'm featuring these books is because of the content of the video that we're about to uh, watch. In 2015, September 2015, I was asked to preach at the Brian Bible Church in Louisville, Ohio. We were, there was a four, I brought four messages that weekend on issues related to church history. What you're about to see is the fourth and final video from that conference titled Ball Security, Handing the Truth Off to the Next Generation. And so the premise here is how do you, once the truth has uh, been recovered and we know what Pauline truth is, how do we ensure a clean handoff of the truth to the next generation. That was the task that I was charged with in that message. And as always, I just want to remind you here that if you've enjoyed the content in this series from the Louisville Conference, all of the content was extracted from the Grace History Project, a greater 168 lesson treatment of the loss of the tracing the abandonment and resurgence of Pauline truth from Paul to the present. So if you want to do a deep dive into the history of dispensational truth, uh, church history in general, you're definitely going to want to check out uh, the Grace History Project, and I will leave a link to the description in this video, as well as links to the ministries of Berean Bible Church, and I would encourage you to check those out as well. So without any further delay, we are going to flip this over to the message from 2015, again titled Ball Security handing the truth off to the next generation. So we hope you've enjoyed the rebroadcasting of this material throughout the week. If you have, please consider sharing it, telling other people about it, liking the videos, leaving a comment, anything that you could do to help uh, get the word out about this ministry, as well as the ministry in Louisville. Uh, we and they would certainly appreciate that. Anyway, without any further delay, thanks again for tuning in, and we hope that you enjoy the message. So in the first study, we looked at the fumbled handoff and how, as Paul sought to hand off the truth to the next generation, it, it, it got messed up. Not because of Paul's fault, but just because of the way things went. And we're going to, so we looked at that first. And then we looked at the recovered fumble, and we looked at different groups throughout church history that have believed uh, Pauline truth to varying degrees. We focused most on the Paulicians and then some other groups. And then in our last hour, we talked about first and ten, and we looked at how uh, the grace movement came about as part of the long process of doctrinal resurgence and refinement that began uh, roughly with the year 1800 and came all the way through roughly the last 200 plus years. And what we want to look at in this issue is ball security. How do, where do we go from here? 
Now that the truth has been resurgent to the point that it has been, that we know it today, uh, and that we can stand here and, and, and preach, as, as is taught from this, this pulpit on a weekly basis here in this local assembly and all around the country and all around the world from other pulpits, how do we securely hand this off to the next generation? How do we uh, try to avoid some of the things that happened in the first century, some of the stakes, mistakes that were made, and some of the, the lack of security with the message? And that's what we want to be looking at here as we sort of try to conclude these things. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Dearly Father, we thank you once again for your word, for the saints here in this assembly, for the fact that um, there's enough folks that are interested in, in coming out and, and having a meeting like this and, and, and fellowshipping around your word. We're grateful for all these things. We're grateful for the faithful, consistent uh, testimony of this ministry here, Brian Bible Church. We're grateful for Brother Ted and all the saints here in this assembly. We're grateful for just all that you've done for us through Christ. We pray now that as we spend some time looking at handing the truth off to the next generation, that we'll be careful as always to rightly divide the word of truth and, and uh, orient our thinking around what your word has to say about these things. In Christ's name, amen. amen. The verse there, verse 1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, then in the latter time some shall what? Depart from the faith. He's talking here in 1 Timothy about some departing from the faith. Come over to chapter 6. I don't have a PowerPoint for this study, by the way, okay? So we're going to have to go old school. 1 Timothy chapter 6, look at verse 20. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. Now watch, with which some having erred concerning the faith. When Paul addresses the first epistle to Timothy, two times he says that some shall depart from the faith. And he's, he's clearly aware of the fact that, there, that this is going to happen. But by the time you come to 2 Timothy, go to 2 Timothy chapter 1, look at verse 15. We've been talking a lot about this verse this weekend. Notice how things have changed. He says, this thou knowest, that what? All they which are in Asia be what? So something is going on, right? When he writes the first epistle to Timothy, he says, some shall depart from the faith. And when he writes the final epistle, his, his last one, I believe, that he wrote, that Paul wrote, he looks out there and he says, all they that be in Asia be what? Be turned away from me. So the situation, has it improved or has it gotten worse? It's gotten worse, right? When you look out across the religious landscape today in the, in the year 2015, and you look at where this church and this assembly and others like it, like mine back in Michigan, we are a small, seemingly insignificant group of people in a massive sea of Christianity out there with all sorts of beliefs and, and doctrines and positions and so forth being taught and believed, and we are very small in light of the whole thing, are we not, right? But we're here, you guys are here in Ohio, we're up there in Michigan, and the, the truth is still being taught, but the, the, it's not very popular. It wasn't very popular back then either, was it? Okay. So we've always had, I suppose, a bit of a popularity problem. So how do we go, though, from 1 Timothy, some shall depart from the faith, to 2 Timothy, all they that be in Asia be turned away from me? How does, how does that happen? Well, come with me back to 1 Timothy chapter 1. I believe that it happens through a failure, number one, to hold fast to the form of sound words. It happens... It happens through a failure to, 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 to hold fast and to cleave unto that which, is, that which was we understand from the pen of the Apostle Paul. Now let me just say something, okay? In my thinking on this, I make a distinction. The mass of people that are out there, do they know this message? No. It's our job to what? To teach them that message, right? What I'm concerned with here in this particular study is you and I that know the message how do we that know the message securely hand it off to the next generation without turning the ball over, without fumbling it, without, without creating more problems? How do we do this, those of us that know the message? Obviously, this local assembly and others are endeavoring to labor to have this message go out and go forth and be known and believed. But for us, I'm primarily concerned with in this hour, those of us that know this message, how do we securely pass it off to the next generation. 1 Timothy chapter 1, look at verse 13. He says, Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. 
And the grace, of, and the grace of our Lord was exceed. That's not the verse I want. I'm in the wrong place. Go to Second Timothy chapter one. I'm sorry, Second Timothy chapter one, verse thirteen. Second Timothy chapter one, verse thirteen. He says, "Hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to thy trust, keep by the Holy Ghost that was delivered unto thee." Now notice something here. The verse in verse 15 that we've read a lot about, about all they that be in Asia are to be turned away from me, does that verse have two verses that come before it? How did all they in Asia be, how were they turned away from Paul? How did they come to a position where they turned their back on the message? Remember, the message wasn't lost, the message was what? Willfully abandoned, right? How did they come to, how did this situation come to exist? Verse 13 and 14 help explain that to you. His instruction to Timothy is, Hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me uh, in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus, that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost that dwelleth in us. This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. They are turned away from Paul because they don't do what verse 13 and 14 say. They don't hold fast the form of sound words, and they don't keep that thing which is committed to thy trust in verse 14. And by failing to hold fast unto it, and by failing to keep it, they turn their back on it. Okay, And so there's a, there's a process here that's unfolding as you think about these things. There was a failure to hold fast and keep the form of sound words committed to the Apostle Paul. Now, think about the expressions, hold fast. It's in verse 13. He says, hold fast the form of sound words. And in verse 14, he says, that good thing which is committed unto thee, keep. Both of those are military terms. Okay? Hold fast. What does he say? Hold your hand there and come over to Ephesians 6 quickly. Come over to Ephesians chapter 6. Is Paul's instruction to the church, the body of Christ, to go charge the position, to go, to go take some hill somewhere, or to simply hold fast and maintain the, the amount of truth that we already have? Okay? If you think about the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6, look at verse, four, look at verse 11. Ephesians 6, 11, he says, Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to what? Stand. What's the instruction in that verse? Stand. Is he telling you to, is he telling you to retreat? Is he telling you to advance? He's just telling you to what? Stand your ground. Hold fast. Hold fast the position. Guard the truth. Keep the truth. Stand in the truth. He's not even saying go forward. He's, he's certainly not saying what? Go back. He's saying hold the line. That's what he's saying here. Verse uh, 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to what? Withstand. Withstand. In the evil day, having done all, to what? It's the third time he said it. And then you go to the next verse, and he says it again. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. My point is here, do you get the idea of what Paul wants the saints to do? Does he want them to go forward and try to... And See, look, it, the, the truth is such that you can abandon the truth by going too far forward into error, and you can also abandon the truth by backing away from it, can't you? And his, his teaching here to Timothy, go back to 2 Timothy, or 2 Timothy chapter 1, is to hold fast. Hold fast in that which I've already taught you. Guard it, protect it. That brings up the second word there in verse 14. Keep, he says in verse 14. That good thing which is committed, committed unto thee, keep. That's also a military word. My master's degree is in military history, and we studied, uh, one of my classes, we studied a lot about military uh, warfare in the Middle Ages, right? And you are aware of the fact that a castle was designed to be a military weapon, right? And the ca if you think about the way a castle was laid out, you had the outer wall, right? And then you would fall back then, and there was an inner wall, right? And there was levels within that castle, and in the very central heart, the, very sec the most secure part in that castle was known as the keep. Okay, And if the castle was overrun, if the enemy overran the castle, the order would be given to fall back to the keep. And that was the most secure, centralized, theoretically secure part of that castle where they, where they had goods and provisions and supplies stored up. 
to hopefully be able to withstand an enemy onslaught, right? And so when Paul is talking here in these verses, he's using military terminology to describe the attitude that the believer needs to have toward the doctrine that was committed to his trust. It needs to be held fast unto, and it needs to be kept secure. Come with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Go over to 1 Timothy chapter 4. <coughs> he says it a little bit differently here. He says, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. What's the next word? I'm in 1 first, first Timothy 4, 16. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing so, thou shalt, thou, thou shalt both save thyself and them that what? You get the idea that Paul is very concerned about Timothy holding fast and keeping this form of sound words that was committed to his trust. Folks, the first thing that we have to do, if we're going to have ball security, and that we're going to pass this thing off to the next generation intact, is we have to keep that which has been committed to our trust. We have to keep the doctrine that we've come to understand. Okay, We have to hold the line with respect to the doctrine. Come over to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Is this not what Paul is looking for? Paul is looking for some faithful men. Paul is looking for some men that the truth can be, so that the truth can be taught to these individuals and that these individuals are going to hold the line, they're going to keep, they're going to guard, they're going to protect this doctrine, and they're going to take, turn around and teach the same thing to others. Look at verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus, and the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, change around and update for the times. What's it say? The same. Okay? The same. What does that mean? That means stay the course, right? That means hold the line. That means take, take the same doctrine. Listen, Paul got his doctrine by the direct revelation of Jesus Christ, right? Paul takes that doctrine and faithfully discharges that doctrine to Timothy. And now he's telling Timothy, look, Timothy, what you need to do is you need to go out and you need to find yourself some faithful men that you can teach the same information to. Read the rest of the verse. Um, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to do what? See, the faithfulness of the man in this case is totally dependent on how he's going to keep and hold and protect this what? This doctrine. This form of sound words. And he says to him, he says to him there in verse 2, And the thing which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others, what, others also. That's how it's going to be propagated, folks. That's how it's going to be passed down from generation to generation. You have the, the unerring standard of the Word of God, and it rightly divided, and men learn it. They teach it to other people. Those men teach it to others, teach it to others, teach it to others, and that's how it's going to be passed on. But if it's, if it's altered, if it's moved away from in any way, shape, manner, or form, so it's no longer the way that Paul would have it to be taught, then, then you're getting into something that's not going to lead to a secure handoff, but the ball is going to be what? Fumbled again. Come with me if you... Uh, look at verse 3 and 4. So I, I mentioned to you back in chapter 1, this issue of holding fast and keeping in verse 13 and 14 there as being military references. Look at verse 3. Paul tells Timothy... After instructing him to find some faithful men, he says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good what? Soldier. Paul, in, Paul fully expects that in order for Timothy to do this, is he going to encounter hardness and hardship? Is it gonna, in other words, is this going to be easy to do? It is not going to be easy to do. And the reason it's not going to be easy to do is because there's a policy of evil against the truth. There always has been ever since the Garden of Eden. There's been a policy of evil against the truth. And Satan is seeking to undermine this truth and make it and hide this truth and obscure this truth so that less people become established in the faith. We studied that last yesterday, right? Romans 16, 25, about, about the preaching of Jesus Christ. He says, My gospel, the preaching of Christ according to the Revelation mystery and the scriptures of the prophets, and how those things are necessary to establish. The believer. Well, there's going to be a policy of evil against the truth, and Paul knows it, and so he instructs Timothy here to endure hardness as a good soldier. Look at verse 4. No man that warreth entangleth himself in the affairs of this life, 
that it may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Folks, are you, if you are going to stand for the truth, are you going to be involved in a spiritual warfare? Yes. Is there going to be things that are going to happen that are going to be uncomfortable, that are going to be challenging, that are going to make you want to quit, that are going to make you want to throw up your hands and give up? Okay? Paul is saying to hold the line. Come over to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Look at verse 10. Demas is an example of somebody that didn't want to do this. It says here, verse 10, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present what? See, did Demas want to endure the hardness of chapter 2? No. He didn't want to endure the hardness of chapter 2. So the things of the world were more enticing. They were more you know, uh, uh, valuable to Demas. He put more weight and stock in those things than the truth of the Word of God. And so he deserts the Apostle Paul. Come over to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Come over to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Look at verse 18. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Look at verse 18. All through the pastoral epistles, Paul uses this, this language and this imagery of warfare and battle and so on. Look at verse 18. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou mightest war a what? Good warfare. What is a good warfare? Look at the next verse. Holding faith. So is a good warfare walking away from the faith? Is a good warfare walking away from the doctrine? No. A good warfare is to hold fast that form of sound words, to stand fast in that faith committed to the Apostle Paul and so forth. And he says there in verse 19, holding faith and a good conscience, with, now watch, with some having put away. If you're going to put it away, you are making a conscious choice to do that, aren't you? That's why I said to you that the truth was not lost. Where in the world did that truth go? Darn it, I lost it. No. It was willfully what? Abandoned. Abandoned. People knew what it was. They knew what the doctrine was. Verse 19, holding faith and good conscience, which some having put away concerning the faith. They make a conscious choice to abandon it and walk away from it. And what's the result in that verse? They've made what? Shipwreck. They've taken the ship and run it into the reef. That's the, that's the result. So it occurs to me, as we think about these things, come back to 1 Timothy chapter 6, that we should spend a little bit of time at least talking about how is it then that people depart from the faith? Okay? How, 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 what forces, what dynamics, if you will, are out there that lead to one departing this message? I have heard numerous people throughout the course of my ministry, which isn't very, nearly as long as Brother Ted's, say things like, I'll never leave this message. This is so great. I don't understand why everybody doesn't see this message. And you go a little further down the line, and guess what? They leave the message. What are the dynamics that are in play that would lead somebody to do that? I want to spend a little bit of time talking about that. Look at this verse we looked at yesterday, 1 Timothy 6, verse 20. He says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Notice again the word what? What word shows up there? Keep. Keep. Right? He's saying, keep it, protect it, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings. I said this to you yesterday, and I want to point it out to you again. Notice there are two things there that Paul's instructing Timothy to do. Number one, he needs to keep some things. He needs to secure the doctrine, he needs to keep the teaching, right? But what else does it say there? Avoiding what? Profane and vain babblings. So if the doctrine is going to be securely handed off and it's going to be kept 
and it's going to be entrusted to faithful men, and all these sorts of things that Paul is talking about here, two things are going to have to happen. Number one, it's going to have to be kept secure, right? But you're also then, in keeping it secure, you're going to have to avoid some things. What are you going to have to avoid in the verse? Avoiding profane and vain what? Babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called. Come with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Avoid profane and vain babblings. I'm going to spend a lot of, look, oppositions of science falsely so-called, evolution, silly stuff, okay? You, you, you should obviously what? Avoid that, right? I mean, you've got to be kidding me, right? I mean, you're going to believe, wh wh where, do you ever see, where do you ever see nothing becoming something? The, the, of the five laws of logic, the fifth one is the law of causality, and the law of causality says nothing cannot make something. So if I got a whole bunch of nothing over here, how is that nothing on its own going to become something? The answer is what? It's not, right? God Almighty, and by the way, have you ever noticed how a atheist will ridicule a theist, a believer in God, because he believes in something, because he believes in the idea of eternal God? You ever notice that? You ever notice so how the atheist never addresses the question of his belief in the eternality of matter? Both worldviews are requiring you to believe in the trust in something that's what? Eternal, right? One, you're believing in the eternal nature of God Almighty Himself. The other one, you're believing in the eternal nature of the matter. And not only are you believing that the matter itself is eternal, but the matter on its own is capable of what? Bringing order out of disorder. I say this to my high school students all the time. If I take crust and sauce and cheese and pepperoni and I lay them all out on the counter and I come back in 100 years, how many of you think that they will have assembled themselves together into a pizza? <laughs> they won't. It won't happen. Why? Because you've never, trust me, I have two boys at home. I have never seen order come out of disorder apart from an outside intelligent intervention. <laughs> Am I right about that? Yeah. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. So that's all I'm going to say about oppositions of science falsely so called. Okay? We'll just deal with that and move on. But is that enticing to a lot of people? All that stuff. It sure is. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 3. Verse 2, he says, Preach the word, be instant in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the, time will, for the time will come when they will not endure what? Sound doctrine. But after their own what? Lusts. Shall they heap to themselves teachers having what? Itching ears. Now watch. And they shall turn away their ears from what? the truth, and shall be turned unto what? Folks, is that not the problem with the body of Christ at large? There's a lot of itching ear teaching going on. There's a lot of, oh, just, just come over here and stroke my ear and just tell me what I want to hear, right? But notice what's going on here. They have the truth. What, look at verse 3 again. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. So they've, they, see how they've moved from just not keeping the truth, and now they're listening to stuff that they what? Ought to be avoiding. Right? And they're not avoiding it. Verse, th verse 4, and they shall turn away. Again, the truth was not lost. It was willfully turned away from. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto what? Fables. What's a fable? A fable is a story, right? How much of what passes off today as teaching and preaching in Christian circles is nothing more than story hour? Look, I'm, it, it's just the way it is, right? Every, everything is based upon some subjective emotional experience that's happened. Not based on what? 
not based on God's word. Not based, folks. We need to base what we believe on, on God's word. I'll tell you a story. I was teaching a class, and um, in high school, and this kid. He was kind of an outspoken Christian kid, and I perceived that he was somewhat possibly Pentecostal. And I asked him, I said, how do you know that what you believe is true? You know what he told me? He said, well, I just feel God there when I believe it. And he went on about how he felt warm and fuzzy and all these sorts of things, right? girl sitting in the back corner raises her hand and she says, well, Mr. Ross, that's all fine and good, but I'm a Wiccan. And my Wiccan religion makes me feel all the same ways he's just describing. You see the problem? If all we're going to go by is stories and fables and feelings and all these sorts of things to justify where the truth is, then does anything go? Anything goes, right? And what Paul is saying here is, look, Timothy, here's what's going to happen. They're not going to endure sound doctrine. They're going to turn away their ears from the truth. They're going to heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they're going to be turned unto fables. Paul says a lot about this. Come over to 1 Timothy chapter, uh, chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 4. In verse 3, he says, As I besought thee to abide still in, in Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other what? Doctrine. Doctrine. Verse 4, Neither give heed. To give heed to something means to what? Mm -hmm. To listen to it, to pay attention to it. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly what? Edifying. Because what becomes the authority for you then is the story that brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so told about what happened to, to Grandma Tilly and, 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 and Cousin Esther 50 years ago and not what this book says. Verse, uh, look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, look at verse 7. He says, but refuse profane and what? old wise fables folks it's a it's a terrible thing when the state of the church at large is more concerned with the telling of old wise fables than they are about preaching the truth you know look I, I'm, I'm a guest in this assembly so I want to be careful some of the things I say okay because I don't want to offend anybody that's not my point in being here but do you ever notice how Christian people are worried about the Smurfs and Star Wars and Harry Potter, and all this stuff, while they're reading Bibles that don't accurately give them God's Word. You know what that is? That's a satanic policy of evil to confuse them and get them off worried about everything and everything else other than what they should be concerned with. Okay? Now, I'm not saying that all those things are good, okay? But what I'm saying is there's a focus there that's off on all these righteous movements and all this stuff that's going on out there in the world, and in the meantime, they're being duped and sold a bill of goods to what they think is even the final authority that their faith is based on. And you think that, 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 that we're in a good situation here? Look, if it's not for us, if we're not going to secure the ball and pass it off to the next generation, then we're going to end up exactly like they were in that gap of time between 70 A.D. and 150. It is incumbent upon those of us who know the truth, that we stand for the truth, and that we teach the truth, and we avoid profane and vain babbling. We avoid, we secure the doctrine, we hold fast to the doctrine, but we avoid those things that Paul warns about that are going to overthrow people's faith in the Scriptures. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. In verse 3, he says, If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing what? Nothing. But doting about, here it is again, questions and scribes of words, whereof coveth envy, strife, railing, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth. This issue, come back to chapter end of chapter 6. Verse 20 and 21 again. 
O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. Now watch. Which, which some professing have what? Erred. How did they err? They erred by not avoiding these things. And when they don't avoid these things, they err concerning the what? The faith, the truth. And they make shipwreck, as he says in 1 Timothy chapter 1. So, avoiding profane and vain babblings. There's, there's some things that I cut out of the first message. Come to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Paul identifies a situation here. In, verse, in, in 2 Timothy 3, he starts talking about the description of the last days of the dispensation of grace, and he goes down through a, a bunch of different things here. And he says, he talk, verse 5, he talks about having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such do what? Turn away. He says in verse 6, Of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. Look at verse 7. Ever learning and never able to what? Is there a lot of that going on? Yes. A lot of that going on. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Why are they never able to come to the knowledge of the truth? Because they're listening, they're, they're listening to teachers that have itching ears. They're listening to teachers who don't know the doctrine. Okay? We need to do what Paul says here, in my opinion, and keep that which is committed and avoid the things that he tells us that we need to what? Avoid. It's interesting. Come back to 2 Timothy. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but in 2 Timothy, there's four chapters in 2 Timothy. And in all four of the chapters, Paul identifies two individuals that either caused him trouble or that left or departed to faith for whatever reason. And it's interesting that when you think about that, because this is the last book that Paul wrote, and if you, if you look up and study the names of these people and what they mean, they will give you insight into how the truth is abandoned and how it's departed. Because for, for different people, it's departed and abandoned in different ways. And there are different issues that, that people will point to or, and so forth when, when these sorts of things happen. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, look at verse 15. He says, This thou knowest, that all they which be in Asia be turned away from me, as whom is, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. Notice he mentions how many guys there. Two, right? And he talks about how, and he, he, he mentions them in the context of all they that be in Asia be turned away from me. Hold your hand there just quick and go to chapter 4. We saw, we saw in verse 15 there the idea of me turned away. We already mentioned this, but I just want to connect these for you in your thinking. Verse 3, he says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall what? Turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto what? Fables, right? So when Paul says back there in chapter 1, verse 15, that all they that be in Asia be turned away from him, what are they turned away from? They're turned away from the truth that was committed to him and his message and apostleship, right? But these guys, go back to chapter 1, verse 15, Phygelus and Hermogenes. The name Phygelus means fugitive. What's a fugitive? Somebody who's on the run from the, from the authorities, right? Where has God placed the authority today? He's placed the authority today in this dispensation of grace in the writings and ministry of the Apostle Paul. So anybody that's going to run away from Paul is a fugitive. Herm uh, Phygelus. The other guy, Hermogenes, means born of Mercury and Hermes, or, and they, they're named after the pagan gods of war. So all those who turn away from the gospel of the grace of God will forever be fugitives from the God of the Bible, and sooner or later, if they persist long enough in their fugitive state, they'll outright declare war on God's truth for this dispensation. They're going to run away from the truth. They're going to be fugitives of the authority placed in the Apostle Paul. Come over to chapter 2. Chapter 2, look at verse 18. 
who concerning the truth have erred. I'm sorry, verse 17. And their, er, their word will eat at thus the canker, as whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have what? Erred, saying that the resurrection is already passed. The terms Hymenaeus and Philetus, have, they erred concerning the truth. Hymenaeus means loving. Loving. Philetus means amiable. Friendly. Loving and friendly. The meanings of these names are illustrative of the way that many folks operate. Few folks who turn from the truth scream obscenities and vulgarisms which offend the sensitivities of the refined nature of most civilized people. Rather, they often talk about a worthy social cause and expand their abilities and their talents to lead others astray in the name of love or some other thing. And some people denounce the teachings of Bible doctrines and emphasize the need for us to be more loving, more amiable, and more friendly in our demeanor. Now, I'm not saying you should be a jerk to be a jerk. I don't believe that's what Paul did, and I don't think that's the way you should function as a member of the body of Christ. But one of the things that <coughs> leads people away is we're going to be more loving. We're going to be more open-minded. We're going to be more, you know, more of whatever that leads to. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, okay? And that process is one of the things that leads to somebody departing from what? The faith or erring according to the truth. Come to chapter 3. Look at verse 8. Now as uh, Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also, re so do these also resist, resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning what? The faith. The, faith. the name Janus means he who seduces. The name Jambres means soothsayer or mystic. The names of these men offer a rare insight and vivid commentary on the nature of apostasy. All apostasy constitutes a seduction from God's objective standard, which replaced with some mystical subjective philosophy that masquerades as some new truth. This new truth causes those uh, who embrace it to become militant in their defense of this new truth or new philosophy, and this illustrates the progressive nature of apostasy. It starts out by running away, then having erred from the truth, it grows into a hardened resistance to the truth. You guys following me? If you're not, don't tell me you hurt my feelings. Go to chapter 4. Go to chapter 4, verse 10. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. <clears throat> and then uh, go to verse 14. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. Demas, you know what the name Demas means? The name Demas means popular. Popular. If you teach this truth, are you going to be popular? What does Demas want? He want Demas wants people to like him. That's why it says in the verse, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present what? Demas wants to be popular. Demas wants to be revered. Demas wants to have adulation and position and prestige in the world. And he knows that if he sticks with Paul, he's not going to what? Be popular. be popular. Folks, trust me. Could, could Brother Reed and Brother Fellows and Brother Jordan and all, and all the other brothers have much larger, bigger assemblies if they would just compromise on the truth? Yes. They could. If they just compromise on the King James Bible, if they compromise on their stance for Pauline truth or some other thing, it, to, it, for, to be popular, would there be more folks? Now, folks, you should not misunderstand me. I don't think that we should operate and function with the idea that the smaller we are is a size that we're more spiritual than everybody else. 
Because if you care about this message, you should never be satisfied with smallness. You should always be wanting to what? Enlarge. Grow and enlarge. As long as you're doing it correctly, right? As long as you're holding to the doctrine, maintaining the truth, and avoiding the things that you should avoid, should you want to grow and see the message spread? Yes. Demas means popular. You know what Alexander means? Alexander means a helper of men. Demas forsook Paul. He would rather be popular through the love of the world than stand for the truth. Meanwhile, Alexander withstood Paul by getting involved with teachings and doctrines that were designed to help his fellow man. Interesting. Social gospel. All this stuff is in your Bible, and it helps explain the issue of apostasy. Now, according to my understanding of the time frame this morning, I have about between 10 and 15 minutes left. And I want to I want to pivot to address something that I think is related to this and then give you some concluding thoughts for the weekend, okay? I want to talk to you about something that I I've as Ted has alluded to, my father is a grace pastor and I've grown up in the grace message. My sister and I, we were raised by the same parents, went to the same church, sat under the same teaching, went to the same vacation Bible school, the same youth camp, the same Awana, the same everything, right? She is, she's off doing what she wants to do, and I'm here standing teaching you. How does that happen? How, how, how is it that somebody can sit under the same instruction, the same everything, and one person embrace it and accept it as their own, and the other one run away from it, as though they've never even heard it. How does that happen? I believe that we have an issue in our, in our groups, of, in our fellowships, with what I like to call the problem of the second generation grace believer. See, here's, here's, here's been my observation, and I'm giving you my personal, private, subjective opinion here, okay? You're free to disagree with me if you want to, just don't yell at me about it, okay? Here's what I think happens and what I've observed happening. What often happens is a first-generation grace believer has an exp they're, they're in the religious system, and they're confused, and they're under bondage, and they're under performance, and they think they have to do things to get God to accept them and so forth, and then somebody comes along and teaches them about grace, teaches them about Paul, teaches about the word rightly divided, and it answers all their questions. Right, And they have sort of that cathartic experience of the grace message saving them out of, for lack of a better term, their religious bondage, right? And so the grace message really means something to this first generation, right? And so then they have kids, and then they bring their kids to grace conferences, to grace churches, to grace youth camps. They teach them the chart, the chart, the chart, the chart, the chart, and before you know it, the chart becomes their religion. We're, we need to be careful about how we're doing things because it's incumbent upon us to, have to pass this off to the next generation. I, I take my kids to all those things. They, 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 they have, they're involved in all those conferences, all those things, but I fear that, what, that there's a danger with the second, the third, the fourth generation of them identifying with this message and it becoming their religion and they don't get why mom and dad think it's so important. Now, this is probably not the only factor, but I think it is a factor. The children, they grow up learning the chart. They know how to rightly divide, but they lack that identification with the message personally that their mom and dad had as it rescued them from the bondage of religion, and they, 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 they're, they're lacking that. And so for those of us who are grace parents, myself included, and grandparents, who desire that the wonderful message of grace be passed on to the third, fourth, and, 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 and so on generations, I believe, now listen, I believe that it is imperative that the children not only learn the doctrine, but they see the grace of God lived, lived out in the life of the family. 
that it, it's not just a bunch of doctrinal hoops to jump through. Folks, my kids can tell you all the right answers. But I worry, are they believing those things because that's what they believe? Or are they believing those things because that's what they, they know dad wants to hear? You, follow, you with me here? And the life, grace is, yes, the doctrine is important, right? But the doctrine by itself without the life is meaningless. The doctrine ought to produce the life. And the kids and the family see the life lived out that the doctrine produces. And the kids experience the life of the doctrine living in the parents, in the home, and so forth. And it becomes more than just a sterile bunch of written doctrine and a chart on a board. Is everybody following what I'm saying? If you don't, again, don't say anything. Don't hurt my feelings, okay? <laughs> my kids, they can tell you all the right answers. They can do all these things. But what every, what, there's some young people in here. Whatever a young person needs to come to is a point of doctrinal ownership. I had to go through this. When I went to Grace Bible College as a freshman, I knew that my dad believed certain things about the King James Bible and so forth. But I'll be honest with you, I didn't pay attention to everything he said. Just like, you, just like you didn't pay attention to everything your parents said. Right? And so now I'm in this institution of higher learning, and I'm exposed to all these things, and people are being critical of this issue, and so it forces me now as a young person, a 19, 20-year-old person, to have to decide, do I believe the King James Bible is God's word for English-speaking people because I believe it, or do I believe it because Dad said so? When I believe it because I choose to believe it, now I own it as my own. And now it means something to me because the belief belongs to who? Me. Is everybody with me? Another issue that I want to tread lightly on is the issue of choosing wisely when you decide to get married. I've seen far too many grace young people derailed in their choice of spouse. Folks, missionary dating doesn't work. You know what I'm saying? Missionary dating doesn't work. Have any of you guys ever seen the movie um, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade? Okay, great. I'm the only heathen in the room that watches movies. <laughs> There's a scene at the end, the very end of the movie, right, when they, they finally make it through the, the three challenges and they go into the room where all the chalices are and the Knights Templar sitting there and they're, they're trying to pick which chalice was the chalice, right? And the Nazi dude, the evil Nazi dude, he goes in there first and what does he do? He tries to find the prettiest, most ornate chalice and he drinks from it, right? And then he like melts and all that stuff, right? And the Knights Templar looks at Indiana Jones and he says, he has chosen unwisely. Right? So then Indiana Jones gets the point and he looks around and he finds he finds the chalice that is, it's not the most beautiful chalice, it's the simple chalice, it's the one that, that but might have been used by a carpenter and he jigs from it and he lives and the nice Templar says, You have chosen wisely. Okay? <laughs> Folks, who you decide you young people in here, who you decide to marry makes all the difference. And you need to decide these things not based on not based on externals and things that don't matter in the end, but based upon truth. And when, you, and when we give our heart to somebody before, we're in a, before we know where they stand and what they believe, you make it much more difficult for yourself to maintain a faithful stand for the truth. And these are ways that I think the truth becomes, the, the, the ball gets dropped and the ball gets fumbled a little bit in these ways when we seek to pass these things on to other folks. I'm just sharing from you some things that are on my heart about those things. So some concluding thoughts for the weekend. If there's anything I've learned from doing the Grace History Project, it's that forsaking the Pauline pattern in either doctrine or practice results in disaster. Okay? Moving forward, somebody, uh, one of the, the saints here just after the last one asked me, well, what now? Where are we going from here? 
I have some thoughts on that. Moving forward, we need to be pitching doctrinal tents, not erecting fixed structures. Okay? Tents can be moved, picked up, and moved if further study and research of God's word rightly divided indicates that they should be. Okay? In contrast, building fixed doctrinal structures imply that a group is functioning with a fixed mindset and views themselves as already possessing all the truth that there is to possess. Is anyone in here so bold as to say that you think we've got everything right on every issue all the time? If history's taught us anything, is that we can't say that, right? This is a grave mistake to pitch fixed structures because it results in the defense of an entrenched institutional structure instead of allowing the freedom of thought to follow the evidence and the doctrine to the soundest possible conclusion. Along with that, while a growth mindset is imperative, it also carries with it an inherent danger. If we are so open to things that, it, that we fail to test every point of doctrine, belief, and practice by the standard of God's word rightly divided, then that can also overstep its what? Its bounds. We need to strike the delicate balance between protecting the amount of truth that we currently possess and being open to refining our understandings as needed. As Pauline Grace believe, I also believe this, third point. As Pauline Grace believers, I believe that moving forward, our most intense battles moving forward are going to be the sort of an Acts 20-30 variety. Go look at Acts 20-30 quick. Acts 20, verse 30. Paul says here, he's warning the Ephesian elders, and he says, Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking what? Perverse things. From such do what? Folks, I believe that moving forward, our most intense doctrinal battles are not, are going to be of the Acts 20, 30 kind, the thing that spring up from within the camp. Not the stuff outside. Not the stuff outside the, the grace message, if you will, but from where? Within. Let me restart over on that statement. As Pauline grace believers, our most intense battles moving forward are going to be of the Acts 20-30 variety that come from within our own ranks as people depart various aspects of Pauline truth and practice for their own advantage and gain. Given the internal nature of these conflicts, not only will the doctrinal errors be more difficult to detect, but the fallout will be more devastating. Some examples that come to mind, 15 years ago, a little bit more than that, there was the whole house church issue, that it's wrong to meet in any other building other than a house. Then we had the rapture issue, that the that the church, the body of Christ, is going to go through all or part of the tribulation and that there is no such thing as a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. More recently, we face the new reconciliation issue, the teaching that people die and go to hell with their sins forgiven. And also the sonship edification joint heir issues and all of its different permutations and related performance banks-based sanctification issues. These issues moving forward are going to come from within. They're going to be more difficult to detect and to spot because of the commonality in doctrine. But when they occur, there's also going to be the greatest fallout because of it. And lastly, the issue of, the final, the issue of final authority should not be overlooked. In my opinion, there's a direct correlation between an individual's and or group's attitude toward the final authority of the King James Bible and their doctrinal soundness and stance for Pauline truth. Individuals and groups who have unequivocally embraced modern versions and their underlying textual theories have struggled to maintain a clear and consistent Pauline witness. Meanwhile, those who use the King James Bible but merely prefer it have feared marginally better 
in terms of maintaining their stance for following truth. In short, there seems to be a direct relationship to one's stance on the Bible issue and their ability to maintain a consistent and uncompromised dispensational position. In fairness, the mere act of believing the King James Bible to be the Word of God for English-speaking people does not automatically protect one from doctrinal error. You following what I'm saying? And last, some of you folks, somebody asked me this too. Some of you are more, shall we say, in the twilight of your time here on earth. And you look at things and you have a very sensitive heart and mind, if you will, to what you're leaving behind, okay, when it comes to these things. The great resurgence in Pauline truth that we studied this weekend was led by skillful Bible students who were supported financially by like-minded members of the body of Christ. Bollinger does not do what he did without financial support. Brother Jordan does not do the things Brother Jordan has been able to do without financial support. Okay? Without saints who are willing to, for lack of a better term, and I'm not making a commercial here so you all give money to Brother Ted. I'm sure he'd like that. But <laughs> without saints that are willing to do these things, the ability of the truth to stand is compromised, folks. Somebody shared with me a story. I'm not going to tell you who it was. I don't want to give anything away. But I heard a story about, about a man who was running an assembly, and there was a man in his church that had some financial wherewithal. And he told them, hey, listen, when I die, I'm going to will this piece of property to the church as an income property. And while this particular pastor was appreciative of that, in the meantime... Well, the whole church is sitting around waiting for the guy to die. The church is struggling to keep the lights on. Okay? It was this financial support that allowed men such as Bollinger and O'Hare and Jordan in the present to devote their time and attention to the creation of Bible study resources and materials that will continue to influence and impact the body of Christ for years to come. So there's an opportunity here for those who are financially inclined to have a long-reaching effect and impact on the truth through their monetary support of productive grace ministry. Folks, without any of this stuff, we don't end up where we are. Okay? And you just need to, you need to think about these things from the perspective of history. So I've said everything I came to say, really. And I appreciate very much all of you folks listening to me and giving me your attention the last two days. I appreciate Brother Ted and his hospitality and the saints here and, and, and Amy for letting us stay at her house. But we need, to, we need to get on with things. We need to hold fast to the doctrine. We need to avoid the things that we need to avoid. We need to pay attention to what Paul says. And we need to just do the work of the ministry. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for this assembly and for these saints. Appreciate their patience. Appreciate the hospitality of Brand Bible Church. We're grateful for the opportunity to be here.